Hi, I'm Katie. Welcome to the Reshape Podcast. I'm here with Tyler. Not here with Nina again. I know. I know. We thought she would be here today, but she had her baby early. I think we announced that on the last episode. We so did, yeah. She's at home resting and taking it all in. Taking it all in is a good way to put it when you're a new parent. There's highs and lows. Ooh, taking yeah. it all in. You know, the hardest thing I remember about becoming a new parent was this transition of like, whoa, there's something that I'm deeply responsible for that is way more important than me in my own life. And like, that's a, it's an intense transition to go through, you know? And I think as human beings, we want to put everything in a box and polarize everything. Mm. Like, oh, well, it's good or it's bad. It's like, well, actually, it's hard and it's beautiful and yeah. it sucks and it's great. Like, it just kind of all lives in the same package. <laughs> I, I, I see what you're saying. And I also think that sometimes, like, in order to embrace, like, the most beautiful things in life, you've also got to be willing to embrace the things that hurt the most, right? And it's like opening a range in a certain sense. And God knows that my daughters opened a range in me emotionally. So, yeah. Every day they do. I'm over there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know you've got a bio here, and l last week you asked me to read the bio, and y'all kicked me off the bio reading because I was flubbing on my words. Nina's the best bio reader. So yeah, the best bio reader. But it's because Nina can wear her glasses, so uh, she can see. Yeah. I sometimes when I'm on social media, our clips will pop up, and I notice that I'm always fidgeting with my glasses. So I was like, you can't wear your glasses anymore. It's like distracting, but then I can't see as good. So. We're going to see if I'm better than you with less sight. Okay, let's do it. It's all <laughs> Not right. better than you, but like if I can... Hey, if you get... put a teleprompter <laughs> in front of me with some good conversational language, I can read that thing all day. Let me just see if I can get Violence the job done. Violence my strength. Okay. Well, we're really excited today. We have our guest, Lauren Cadillac. Uh, Lauren is a registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor that owns a virtual private practice helping clients from all over the world heal their relationship with food using the intuitive eating framework. Lauren was a competitive bodybuilder and has a history of disordered eating and eating disorders. After recovering and healing her own relationships with food, she became passionate about helping others do the same. Break free from diet culture, release, release the guilt and shame around eating, and live a life that feels good physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Oh, I love all of those. So, you know, in, in our line of work, even though we're really in our, in our company and product focused on movement, diet and food comes up every day here at WeShape. And so we can't pretend that that's not a big piece of it. So that's why we like to have people like Lauren on the podcast who can provide further insight. So uh, welcome, Lauren. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? We're doing great. I... um was kind of on your social media earlier and I actually I just love the work that you're doing I love the content and I, I actually went on Etsy this morning and bought your flashcards for my for my girls thank yeah. you yeah. I love that flashcards? so much yeah tell us about the flashcards yeah, tell, tell people about the flashcards so I have a few decks of affirmation cards they started out as uh, you know for adults I had a client who, you know, through the intuitive eating framework, one of the principles is challenging the food police, you know, this inner dialogue that's generally pretty negative, pretty harsh, pretty critical. And we're trying to challenge that voice, replace it with more kind, compassionate thoughts instead. But if you have been reciting those negative thoughts for so long, it can be really hard to think of something nice to even say to yourself. Mm -hmm. So the two of us together kind of came up with like, five or 10 and she kind of wrote them down and I was like you know I think a lot of people probably have a similar struggle where they want to be nicer to themselves but they don't even really know where to start or where to begin so I created this deck of affirmation cards where there's 52 affirmations for food freedom intuitive eating and body acceptance and then I created a second one for they're called feel good fitness flashcards so as you were just kind of talking about um, diet culture and the fitness industry, they're just intertwined, right? And a lot of us have been taught that exercise is just a way to burn calories and change how our body looks when there are so many benefits to movement from cardiovascular health and gut health and bone strength and mental health and all of that. And a lot of times we miss out on those benefits if we are just focused on um, engaging in punitive exercise. So I created that deck to help people heal their relationship with movement. And then I started thinking because my my brain started going on to kids. We were just chatting a little bit before about how I'm actually pregnant. And so kids had been on my mind. And 
you know, I think growing up, so many of us heard really negative messages around food, um, things I don't need to repeat. I'm sure we can all think of things. And it, that's kind of where it starts, right? Like if you grow up in an environment that's very uh, positive about like all body shapes and sizes, there's not a lot of like food policing going on or body comments going on, you'll continue to like have a more positive relationship with food and body. And kids are born into this world as intuitive eaters, but it's through the messaging that we get from usually well-meaning uh, parents or caretakers, right? They're usually trying to do what they think is uh, most helpful and healthy and all of those things. Or we hear messages in the media and there's social media now. So it's with all those additional messages that that intuitive eating inner wisdom kind of gets stomped down. So I thought, wouldn't it be really cool if we could just keep that there and teach kids like really positive messages about food, that food gives us energy to play and it makes me strong and it, you know, helps my brain think and my arms give great hugs and all bodies are different and just teaching kids these messages so that they don't have to, like I did at, you know, mid twenties and thirties have to undo all of the stuff that we learned through diet culture. So those are my feel good flashcards for kids. And thank you very much for supporting me. <laughs> I absolutely, I, yeah, what I wanted, my intention when, when they arrive is to like put one on the fridge. Like yeah. sometimes I hide little messages in the house. Like I have a little thing I put on my front door that sometimes. I, <laughs> sometimes. that I change every month. So when people come in the house, they like see a different thing and people can take what they want with it. But I also have this thing on our refrigerator that talks because my kids are almost six and, and, and one's 10. And I have like this thing on our fridge. It's like this is the messages that children at this age really want to hear. Right. Like, oh, your opinion matters. And yes, OK, that you yeah. feel the way. So I have that for the adults to see, but that are in our home. But then I was like, oh, it'd be cool. Like now that my kids are reading, like to see like little messages for themselves. So I just pictured your flashcards on our refrigerator. So they'll be rotated and I will absolutely be using them. So thank you so much for that. But I, I want to dive into like kind of like the messaging because I, I thought of something right away when you were talking about that because um, the messaging around food is so important because I think that there can be really direct messaging, but there can also be extremely indirect messaging, right? And I had this experience the other day. We were hanging out at a birthday party and someone at the party was discussing like as a joke, like kind of to make light of um, how someone she knew had gone to a spa and was really trying to make sure she looked her best so she didn't eat anything so she could have a flat stomach. Mm -hmm. And then when she was there, she went in the sauna and overheated and then came out of the sauna and passed out. And she was like, can you believe that? Like, it was like she really wanted just to look so good with her flat stomach. But like, she was like making light of it. And I was sitting there and there were three girls there mm -hmm. that were under 11. And I was like, oh, that funny toxic weight loss culture just slips in, doesn't it? And like you could tell it like didn't compute and I could see the look in Tyler's eyes like here we go, like Katie's going for it. And I didn't, I didn't say anything else, but I just wanted to say one thing because I felt like the children in the room deserved another perspective and I actually held compassion for her because that story felt light to her, that story felt heavy to me. But it was only light for her, prob probably because that message was normalized through family, through friends, through culture. Mm -hmm. So I, I wasn't like in a place of judgment. I was just in a place of like, and this other perspective can live here. Mm -hmm. um, but it just reminded me of how, and I'm not, um, I'm not free from those messages myself. My children earlier on, in my, especially in my 10-year-old's life, I had a lot of uh, you know, eating behaviors around like it had to be a certain way and it had to be quote unquote like clean eating as if that's even a real thing and like you know so I'm not like you know guilt free of that stuff right and so I it's just it's interesting how it can be indirect and also very blatant but in, in either case we can have a level of awareness because of the normalization around food messaging so I don't know like I don't know if you have anything to say to that or if, how do we bring awareness so people can start thinking about these things because I think once you start going, wow, is that healthy for me to believe that? That's when the walls start coming down and behavioral behavioral patterns can shift. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where as soon as you start learning about what diet culture is and how it's harmful, you realize that it's everywhere. It's in those little conversations that people have. And I just want to say I love your response because you kind of acknowledge the story, but also we're like, oh, toxic it's like throwing that word in to yeah. say like, oh, maybe that's not so helpful, you know, to, 
to hear a story where someone passes out because they didn't eat enough, like that's a that's alarming, right? That's not yeah. something that we should be joking about. That's something to be concerned about. So I love that you kind of threw that in to, you know, say to those people around you, hey, that's not actually um, something we should be striving for. But I think, again, we just have grown up with these messages and they've become so normalized that I'm sure the person saying that story didn't think anything of it. It didn't raise any red flags. And I don't know if you happen to see some of the posts that I've done recently. Um, I found some like special cake commercials and some meal play commercials and these ads that we saw in like the early 2000s and seeing them with 2023 eyes is is shocking. But back then it was just kind of what what you did. So I think the first step is like learning about diet culture, you know, learning how that's harmful. And then you'll start to see that it's actually, it's kind of, it's everywhere, even just down to like the packaging of our food, like guilt-free this or, you know, lesser, I know there's a brand called Lesser Evil, which I actually like some of the stuff that they have, but that, I know, you know. I love their popcorn, but can we change I the name? I know, change like I like the name of things, but yeah. like uh, I could do without the name. <laughs> yeah. And it's like hard because I feel like at the root of all of this is judgment in a lot of ways. Like, mm -hmm. and so how do we also not go to the other side of the spectrum and then live in that judgment, right? Because mm -hmm. it all can feel so negative, right? Like I watch myself go from one end of the spectrum, like judging all the food I ate and the rules and the da 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 da, -da all the way to now not being able to unsee all the things that I see, but then kind of judging that too. And I'm like, I want to live in the middle. <laughs> I want to, I want to like. So maybe you can talk with us a little bit about like, what does like food freedom mean to you? Like, what is the relationship that, or maybe even share a little bit about your story or what does food freedom actually look like? Because I feel like every guest we've had on the podcast, we've talked a lot about food freedom, but I love to ask that question because everyone gains different, gives different perspective. And I think that, you know, some less listeners will resonate with one perspective more. So maybe you can share a little bit about what food freedom means for you. It's a great question, too, because I think it's one of those terms that kind of just floats around out there. And some people that are newer to this space are probably like, what the heck does that even mean? Like, what is food freedom? And like you said, everyone probably has a different definition of it. But for me, it just means being free of the mental anguish that food and body image struggles have, have caused me in the past so that I'm able to live the life that I want to live. Um, a little bit about my story like a lot of people, I started dieting in high school. Um, I probably would have been diagnosed with anorexia if I had gone to a doctor. Um, I went to school to study nutrition because I was always dieting. So I was always thinking about food and it was always on my mind. And I always kind of thought if I become a dietitian, I will find out the secret keys, like the, the secret methods to losing weight and like figure it all out basically. And then I was working in the clinical setting at the time, which wasn't really my favorite. I had a friend who recommended doing bodybuilding as a way to kind of pivot my career a little bit because I was always into working out and sports and stuff. And so I got into bodybuilding then, and then that triggered uh, my first off season. I started struggling with bulimia. And so I just, my, my whole world just started to shrink and I think that we assume that okay if we just lose weight then everything will be wonderful and there's something to be said obviously about thin privilege and what that allows you to do in society I'm not um, minimizing that by any means but for me it was like oh if I could just be x percent body fat or I could just look like this or I could win this show or whatever then I'll be happy and fulfilled and my life will be wonderful but I was finding the very opposite for myself. You know, I had no energy. I was moody. My digestion was terrible. Basically, everything that could go wrong kind of went wrong. I didn't have a period anymore. I was snippy. Like, just, I just felt miserable. I couldn't hang out with friends because meal prepping and exercise was all consuming. It was like my life was so small. And so now when I think of food freedom, I think, like, I don't have to do that anymore. Like, I can move in a way that feels good to me. I can, like have the food that feels good to me. I can travel if I want to travel. I can stay home if I want to stay home. You know, I have the flexibility and the freedom to be able to do that because I'm no longer chasing this aesthetic ideal, I guess. I think that's just such an important message you said. I feel like we have that echoed on this podcast over and over again, particularly from people who kind of gravitate more towards that 
perfectionism and trying to do something and be something to facilitate um, their desire to feel whole, right? Yeah. And I think it's so important. Like people, there's so many people out there who still have this um, belief that if they get there, they'll they'll be happy, right? If I could just find the motivation and do the blah 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 blah, blah uh, eventually I'll be happy. And I think I just want to echo this because it's so important that you were reaching the quote unquote pinnacle of what it means to have the perfect physique, right? And I'm sure that people were praising you like crazy for it. And you were miserable. You, did, you couldn't have relationships with your friends. You couldn't enjoy your life. It was just discipline, discipline, discipline all the time. You were actually becoming more unhealthy because of these habits as well. And I just think it's such an important lesson for people to hear because it's about finding that peace within, that balance, that desire to care for your body rather than the, 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 the drive to change it so you can feel that external gratification from outside yourself. So I just, I mean, thank you for sharing that and great journey. I mean, so, so cool to see you come out of that. So like, you know, what was the transition period like for you? How did you go Let from- Let me say, I want to say one thing that she yeah. said there that was like, and, and I don't know if this resonates with you, Lauren, but when you were talking about your story, I was like, oh, you know, human beings are meant to be expansive, right? Like to evolve. Mm -hmm. But so many of the, so much, so many of us live our life in a constricting way, mm -hmm. right? Like with rules and certain beliefs that keep us small and, and, and we sell it to ourselves. But like, when I think about like the ultimate human experience, it's, it's expansive. It's, it's, it's liberating. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't live in a box like that. And so just to be thinking about that concept when we make choices, you know, because, oh, I'm doing this thing. It's like, is that expansive? Is that like, like contributing to my growth and evolution as a human being? Or is that making me smaller? Could be a potential lens that we look through when we're evaluating some of our decisions about, you know, food and, and movement and, and the ways that we're contributing to some of the toxic beliefs in our culture. Mm hmm. It makes me think of one of the affirmations that I have on the card that is, uh, I deserve to take up space. I think especially yeah. as women, we're taught to shrink, not just mm -hmm. physically, but also be quiet, you know, stay in line, like be pretty, like just shrink yourself. Don't be too much. You know, all of the, that messaging and what was said earlier too, like a lot of it stemming from not enoughness, like we're always sold that we're not enough in one way or the other. And you can be enough usually if you buy X, Y, and Z, right? Like our skin's not wrinkle free enough our hair's not unfrizzy enough or whatever we're not thin enough we're not pretty enough we're not whatever enough and there's usually some solution quote unquote that you can spend money that. on to I often joke enough. with Tyler I'm like you go share that opinion because you'll be seen as a thought leader and like I need a break from radical feminist yeah <laughs> title for a moment <laughs> like it's like we could actually have the same opinion, but yours will be perceived as like the boss mm -hmm. um, <laughs> or like the thought leader. And I'm going to more likely be not everybody. There's plenty of people who embrace some of these beliefs, especially our team and close friends and family. But sometimes I get, you know, anxiety putting our message out there because I'm like, I yeah. feel like I'm putting a target on my back. Right. Because mm -hmm. I'm not conforming to a lot of the ways that society wants me to conform to. And so you go to that birthday party and you realize, wow, there are so many people who are just stuck in this old mold and um, don't even see it. Don't even realize they're stuck in that old mold. And that's that's the tough part. It's the, that's the awareness we keep trying to. Well, that's why I'm always like, I don't know if I it's like to say something. I felt like in that moment I had two choices and it was just ignore this and just move on. <laughs> Hey there, if you're enjoying the We Shape podcast and you've heard us talk about We Shape before, then you're probably thinking to yourself, hey, what is We Shape? Well, at We Shape, we create personalized at home workouts for every single one of our members. These are workouts where every single movement is customized to you to help you connect with your body and care for your body in a much more meaningful way. We also have a community of people there to support you, to help uplift you as you examine your beliefs, set new intentions, and again, start showing up for yourself as an act of self-care rather than trying to do your workouts as an act of self-judgment. And hey, if you're a fan of the podcast, we also do a live podcast discussion group on Zoom, as well as other Q&As, as well as free challenges for all of our members to help you get motivated to actually start taking action to caring for yourself so you can feel better in your body and about your body. So if you want to try WeShape for free for two full weeks, go to WeShape.com backslash podcast and you can get started today. Saul, the one of the little girls was like, 
like dropped into the story and was like in the story with her, I was like, oh no, like this can't be the only narrative that is in this story right now. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was like, who cares what they think of you? Like just, you're not doing it for that, you know, but it is interesting to see how women, as people identify as female women especially, have sort of this extra target of like, actually, I don't want to define my worth by how I look or how much I weigh or what jeans I fit into or your identity, you know, your someone else's ideal of beauty. Like, I actually don't want to do that. It's exhausting. Like, mm-hmm. part of the, the, the challenging part of unsubscribing to that belief system is some of the negative backlash that women do receive when they say, I don't want to do that anymore. And, and I want to encourage and empower women to really just, you know, cultivate community around you that can hold you up through that. Because at the same side, even though it's like really hard sometimes, the amount of power and liberation I've personally had from not having to spend so much of my time and energy and thought and focus on, for instance, the food that I'm eating has been incredibly liberating. Like, I feel like I have, like, I, again, I feel so much more expansive. I'm like, I have so much more of me to to express in different ways and connect with myself in different ways. And just, like, from a practical day-to-day perspective, time. I have, like, a lot more time. Yeah. You know, we don't even realize how much energy and time we give these things. And then when you step back and go, for what? Like, on my deathbed, am I going to be like, oh, I'm so glad I only ate you know this for th- it's like i don't i Did don't you say your deathbed i'm so happy right now oh my god i'm like the most morbid guy I like wake up every day and it's like i'm gonna die one day and i might i might i need to do something powerful with my day but i've never heard you say that before well i just when i think oh when god. i think of back on like than talk. when i think back on <laughs> all the time i've given it's like i probably rather spend time traveling or i probably rather spend time with my family or friend you know it's yeah. just we don't even know how much we give to it so, so going back to the question I was asking there, so, you know, we talked about food freedom, what that means for you. Um, you shared a little bit about your story. How did you bridge the gap? How do you bridge the gap from like, wait a second, this is messed up. I'm stuck in something toxic to, wow, I f- I'm, I'm doing it and I feel inspired to teach it and help others do the same. A lot of time, <laughs> a lot of energy that's when a, I first started important. learning. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to highlight the time piece because- diet culture kind of teaches us oh hey you can do things in 30 60 90 days you know like yeah sure you can make positive changes in those short periods of time but if you've spent your whole life in diet culture and now you're just realizing what it is and that it's maybe not been helpful for you it's going to take a long time to kind of undo some of that messaging so i think it's really important to kind of start off with that i know for me it was at first just trying to consume as much information about this as I could, reading different books, listening to different podcasts, following different people on social media, and just kind of absorbing information that way. Um, I have a guest coach within my coaching program, Vinnie Wellsby. Something that they talk a lot about is this idea of like constant learner mode. So while it's awesome to, um, and this is again, their concept, not mine. (laughs) Well, it's awesome to read the books and do the podcast and, and learn all of the things there's the application of it too right like there's you you have to challenge those food rules right you have to go out and eat those foods that were scary you have to you know start asking questions about how food makes you feel you have to explore this that and the other thing like going out and actually doing the things is important too you know learning about it i think is probably the first step and then once you've kind of acquired some information about what action you can take then you can go on and, and say, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm actually going to eat when I'm hungry. I'm going to, you know, stop enforcing these rules. I'm going to give myself permission to eat X, Y, Z. I'm going to start talking a little bit nicer to myself. I'm going to give myself permission to rest if I want to rest, you know, things like that. You said something there that I just want to highlight again that I think is so beautiful, which is you, you just listened to a lot of podcasts. You exposed yourself to a lot of information Mm -hmm. that would help you become more aware of the transition that's needed. And I I think that's so powerful because oftentimes we get kind of caught into our routine and we get in our car and we turn on the radio or we put on some podcast that's like something that we are just want to just kind of numb out and connect to or whatever. But, you know, in my life, what I've found is if I take the time to say, okay, here's something that I'm struggling with or something that I'm interested in, 
And I go out there and identify the books or the podcasts or the things that might help support me in that. And I just, I just consistently expose myself to that every single day or as often as possible. It's like they have this old saying that says, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And the reality is if you spend 30 minutes or an hour a day, you know, driving to and from work or going for a walk or before bed or whatever, reading, um, consuming uh, on podcast, audio, you know, even video, like documentaries, like information around the subject that you're feeling like you're struggling with, you will start to change your beliefs naturally because of that, because they're going to challenge your current system of believing. I feel like so few people um, leverage the freedom of information that we have available to us in a way that can be really helpful to their uh, pursuits of, of growth and, and um, you know, connecting more to themselves. So I just want to highlight, I think it's so important. Well, I also think it's important. So we talked, you know, I've talked a lot about Lauren, this idea of when um, you're born, you have this like internal dial that's like turned to a, a 10 and, and you'll discover when your baby comes that that baby doesn't care if you're in a meeting or on a podcast, like if they're hungry or need a diaper change, here we go, right? Yep. And then we have this other dial that's like gets turned up over time that's like from the outside. And for us here at WeShape, it, it, I believe it's our goal to help people turn that, that, that internal dial of self and what's best for self up just a little bit louder than the external. We're not really going to ever be able to turn that down because we don't live in, we're not going to go live alone in a cave. Like we, we, yeah. we live in a society, we live in a culture that has this stuff going on. And so how can I connect with myself in a meaningful way? And the tricky thing about that is what works for someone does not mean is what's going to work for you. And that's why when people come in, they're like, well, how many times a week should I exercise? Well, what exactly should I eat? And I'm like, the real goal needs to be connecting with self and then you telling me what you think that should be. Right. Yes. So, for instance, like. So let me just clarify that I think that you should consume information <laughs> and then connect with self and say, what's true for me? What do I believe? What do I want to examine? But I not purely you are the guru and I'm going to neglect, you know, my own intuition and belief. No, I hear you. But it was just a reminder to me, this idea around asking ourselves that question, like, what do I need in this moment or what do I need at this point in my life? And then seeing what comes up and trying it. And then mm -hmm. it's a good practice for learning how to turn up that internal dial, because sometimes I ask myself, what do I need? And then I offer myself that. And then I'm like, I did not need that. I went the wrong path. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, it's OK, you're learning. Right. And then other times I'm like, what do I need? And I'm like, I think I need this. And then I do that and I go, oh, you were really able to, to connect. And that's what that feels like when and it's just it's practicing that, but we're 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 in a culture that says like like you're talking about, okay, look this way. It's thirty days. Here's the solution. Do this. Do that. And I think really coming home to self means that only you can really decide what works best for you. But making that connection and turning that internal dial up takes time and it takes practice. So. Like, for instance, Tyler is the kind of person who, when he's, like, really, like, trying to dissect something, will go and read all that information. And sometimes that actually makes it worse, worse for me. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, when we recently went on vacation, I brought a um, fiction book on the trip. And I was like, I'm going to read a fiction book. I haven't read a fiction book in 20 years. And I read this huge book in, like, a few days. And I was, like, or, like, a week or something. And I was like, oh, my God, that was so fun. And, and, it, and it allowed me to think about things in a different way and get perspective and think and... And I was like, oh, like, I didn't realize I needed that. But I think through that experimentation, we can decide what we need. And then here comes the challenging part. But I think it's still possible. Discovering what you need often goes against what other people tell you they think you should, should do. Right. Not all the time, but sometimes it does. And really having to say, oh, I'm sorry, this is what I actually need. And I'm actually not available for that path, but good for you is right. a hard thing to do and it takes practice but it doesn't mean that that path isn't the right path for you it just mm -hmm. means that it's hard to to say it's different from what people expect right and i think people are often surprised to find out that this work of working towards food freedom isn't just about food it's also about reconnecting to your emotional world and your internal world and asking those questions. How am I feeling right now? What do I need? Putting yourself first, saying no, setting boundaries, you know, assessing all of that stuff that doesn't really come to mind when you think of, you know, stepping away from dieting, to, like boundary setting doesn't really come to mind first and foremost, but that's what it is, right? Like we've kind of been taught to put our needs to the side and just take care of everyone else first, but your needs matter. And if you aren't getting them met, things are going to go haywire one way or the other. 
It's like when people come into WeShape for the workout, I'm like, surprise! It's so much more than that because the connection that we have with our food and with our body and with exercise Mm -hmm. touches so many parts of like our psyche and our culture and our and our emotional space right it they 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 all kind of go together (laughs) you said something powerful you said something it was funny i was on a call with one of our members who was a uh, one of the winners of our feel good challenges right so these aren't a challenge where we're trying to get people to lose weight or something like that. We're just trying to get them, hey, just show up for yourself for 30 days, you know, mm-hmm. and take care of yourself. And, you know, she was really happy. She was like on this this really good path. And she's like, you know, I was on this path and I found you guys and I'm on this path now. I feel really good, but I'm so scared that I'm going to go back to this path. I'm so scared that I'm going to stop. I'm not going to be able to prioritize me over these other things. And, mm-hmm. you know, I have my son. I'm a single mom. Like I feel so much pressure around that. And I'm like, wow, that's so real. But you have to remember that the way you show up in the world and what your child observes of you, that that's going to be who they are. And so if you're going to neglect yourself and treat yourself poorly and never show up for yourself and give yourself away to everyone else and never connect with yourself, well, then that's what you're passing on. You're not passing on more time and stuff with them that you think you are. So you have to carve out time for yourself. And it's so important. And again, I have so much empathy for women in today's society because whenever I talk to someone, that is the, 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 the group of people who has the hardest time saying, what do I need? How do I show up for me? Because it's so taught that you have to show up for everyone else and you have to be a good little girl and you have to be a great mom and a great wife and a great partner and a great this and a great that. And it, you just lose sight of self. And that process of going back to self then becomes so much harder, which I, uh, right. I've witnessed. And it's, um, I have a lot of empathy for that. But anyways, just wanted to mention that. Um, you know, I, I, do, I do have a pivot, though, real quick. I heard you say something earlier on that I want to um, touch on. Um, okay. You said punitive exercise. Yes. And I love that because we have done a lot of podcasts. In fact, I think this is our our year anniversary of podcasts right now. Is it? Yeah, I think so. And um, wow. yeah, and uh, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody in our podcast take that um, that stance, even though that's something that we tend to talk about. Exercise is not a punishment for how you look or what you ate. It's an act of self-care so you can feel good in your body and take care of your body. So maybe you could just touch on that a little bit, considering that you came from this bodybuilding, this sport of like fitness. And, you know, now I don't know what you do now, but I'm sure that it's a lot more focused on self-care and, and you know, <laughs> feeling good. So touch on Much that. Much more gentle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people can probably relate to this idea of exercise feeling like a way to undo or make up for the food that we ate. I, I I was telling you you earlier about these commercials that I was watching and posting, and there's this other yo play one where she's looking into the free uh, looking into the fridge at this cheesecake, and I think actually yo play had to remove the ad because uh, it was flagged for eating disorder stuff. Basically, it was like she's looking in the fridge. She's like, okay, I could eat this. And if I eat this and walk in place or if I eat this and do some jumping jacks at the same time, or maybe if I do jumping jacks and she's like, you know, rattling off all these things in her head of like how she can deserve to eat this cheesecake. Right. And I think all of us can kind of relate to that of like seeing food as, okay, if I eat this thing, then I have to do this much exercise. And when you do that, like it's not enjoyable like no one wants to engage in exercise when they feel like it's it's coming from a place of shame right like you feel like you're you're bad you're disgusting you're you know all these things that I know I used to tell myself like I can't believe you ate that or this very harsh inner voice it's like I I have these stories that are memories that pop up on Facebook or Instagram which are always very humbling (laughs) I kind of hate seeing them but sometimes they pop up from my bodybuilding days and I know that I've posted things where it's like, oh, I had extra this at this barbecue, which means I need to now do extra cardio and to, you know, to try to burn it off. And I think just a lot of people probably have that mentality with exercise where it's really just a way to burn calories. It's so bad. So what does exercise mean to you now and what does it do for you now? Yeah, for me now, it's preventing pain. So back pain specifically, I want to be as pain-free as I can possibly be. I do have, um, I think I might have psoriatic arthritis. So I sometimes get flare-ups and like different joints and stuff. And 
the right amount of movement for me helps with that. Too much exacerbates it. Not enough exacerbates it. So that's a big one for me. I also like to just, uh, you know, I was big on sports growing up. So my husband and I will randomly play pickleball or you know, I want to be able to participate in certain activities and enjoy them. And if I want to play basketball, I could play basketball or volleyball or whatever it is. Um, core strength, now that I am pregnant, that's something that I am thinking about, you know, again, protecting my back mostly, but helping with maybe if that will help with labor and recovery and all of that stuff. Um, longevity, but I would say like the top is mostly my mental health, you know, anxiety. It helps with reducing anxiety for me. And I think what is important to note is that it took a lot of time to get to this place and it took a lot of permission to rest to be able to come back around and see exercise as a positive because it was always so tied to shaping my shoulders a certain way or growing my glutes a certain way or getting my abs to show more or whatever. Now it's, you know, I had to really go through that period of, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to get on the Stairmaster. I don't want to go do this workout just because this random person on the internet says I should. You know, that permission to rest was so key that now I can come back around and see like, I actually feel really good when I move, you know, not excessively, but I feel good when I move, you know, it, it makes me feel energized. It makes me feel less anxious and it makes my back feel better. And I think that the point on feeling energized was really big for me because I remember hearing that, you know, if you don't feel like you can't walk the next day or you're not like dead at the end of a workout, it wasn't, it didn't count. It wasn't enough. And now like, well, it's supposed to it's not supposed to kill you. <laughs> like we're not going to like yeah. destroy ourselves. So that was a really big shift for me. I don't know if either of you can relate to that, but that was a big Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Yeah. You said three things that I really love there. One is just the energy. I think that people think of exercise as a drain on energy because their experience is I went to the gym, took a class and got my butt kicked and I was sore for a week and I couldn't move and it was horrible. Versus yes, and like, maybe they're dieting at the same time, right? right? Exactly. So they're so not eating enough. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, that's most people's experience, but the reality is, you know, if you're if you're slow, if you focus on movement quality, what we like to focus on strength, flexibility, balance, and coordination through all of the primary movements of the human body. If you focus on those things and you go real slow and gradually and you make slow progress, well, guess what? Not only are you getting stronger and more flexible and more balanced and coordinated, but the mitochondria, the power plants of your body are slowly learning how to produce more energy. And that means mm -hmm. by spending time exercising, you are actually able to cultivate more physical energy. Uh, the second thing that I love that you said is the mental health side of it. I always joke with people, if you could encapsulate the benefits of exercise, uh, you know, reduction in depression, anxiety, more mental clarity, like all the physical attributes, you'd be a trillionaire, right? If it was a, if it was a, a capsule, right? But people don't want to put the effort into that because they're still taking the approach of, I have to exercise because I hate the way I look or because I eat too much of this or that, right? So I think right. that's so powerful to touch on. And then the last piece, which I think is great, which I don't, again, I just don't hear a lot of people talking about it. We're talking a lot about food freedom. There's a large movement about food freedom right now and opting out from diets. And fitness is lagging behind that. And when you ask somebody who has been through the ringer on fitness what fitness means to them now, they all say the same thing fundamentally. I want movement freedom. Mm. I want to be able to move my body pain-free for as long as possible doing the things that I love. And that's what I hear over and over again with our members, um, with people that we talk to, is if I could fast forward everybody into their 70s, 80s, and 90s, they don't give a crap how big their butt muscles are or how flat their stomach is, right? They want to feel good in their body and be able to move throughout their daily life. And that's it. And so, you know, I just th thanks for sharing that and sharing the transition because um, it's really hard. I mean, you, you talked, we were on a podcast the other day talking to this uh, person and they were talking about weight loss. And then we corrected them back to, you know, feeling good in your body and connecting with your body. And then I swear like five times throughout the conversation. So if we wanted to lose weight, we're not, you could just, you could just tell, like, it's just so <laughs> patterned into us that we have to have conversations like this to bring awareness to the reality that that is not fitness. Fitness is not burning calories and sweating hard and pumping your muscles without any um, without any focus on movement quality or how things feel in your body. Fitness is connecting with your body and creating movement freedom, right? And right. I think that redefining that is such an important thing that we need to do in our culture right now. Yeah, and I also think that people associate weight loss with those positive benefits, right? Like if I lose weight, then I'll have energy. If I lose weight, then I'll be more flexible or be stronger or more, or more functional or whatever. And 
as we just said before, a lot of times when you're trying to lose weight, you're not eating enough, which makes exercise extra miserable if you're you know, engaging in something that you only are taking because you think it's high intensity or whatever. So now your energy levels are lower. You feel weaker because you're not eating. You know, if you can just focus on, again, things that feel good, eating to fuel your workout, working out in a way that feels good to you, working out in a way that gives you energy, it's like you can achieve that good feeling whether you lose weight or not, whether you lose weight, stay the same or gain, right? Like we can we can still achieve those positive outcomes. Yeah, and it's such a beautiful vehicle for connection with self. You know, when you, when you ask yourself when I'm doing something, where do I feel this? What does it feel yeah. like? You know, how does it make me feel in my body? You know, it's like the more we ask those questions and drop in from, from head down into body, it's just like that's what gives us the intuition, I think, sometimes to then approach any situation in life and be like, wait, hold on. How does this feel for me, not from a, lo a, a logical level or a mental level, but from an emotional and a physical level? And um, it's such an important thing that I think people need to focus on rather than kicking their own butts because they feel shitty about themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we spend a lot of time up in our heads. That's something I talk to my clients a lot about is like moving the energy down and like reconnecting yeah. to the space below your chin, basically, because we're just kind of with our thoughts all the time instead of asking like, what's physically going on? What do I feel? And there's a lot of infinite value and wisdom in that connection of how my body feels. It's another thing I think here we're really trying to rewire that connection. But we've really enjoyed having Can you. Oh, question? what one more so question? This one yeah, up. we got. So I want to. one more. Like we'll do like a parabola here. We'll come back to the start. Um, what are your three favorite cards that you created? I would just love to hear those before we go. Um, or two, or one. Tyler or can't wait for the mind. deck. It's yeah. in the mail, but he can't. Oh, he can't wait. Kids yeah. one. <laughs> Uh, sure. We'll I good. think for the kids, I think bodies come in different shapes and sizes is so powerful mm -hmm. because I think so many of us had this idea that we all needed to be X size or weigh X amount of pounds. You know, we can think of a million different pop culture references that told us that. And if we had just learned that like, like dogs, dogs are all different, right? Like a Doberman and a Chihuahua and a German Shepherd and like a Maltese. You can't overfeed the smaller dogs to make them look like Dobermans and you can't starve the Dobermans to look like a teacup dog. Like they're different. They're, they're different. And that's how our bodies are too. So that's a big, uh, I like that one a lot. Um, challenges help me grow. You know, some, I post these sometimes and adults are like, I need those for me. I'm like, they're pretty good. For well, a lot of adulthood is just reparenting, yeah, right? So I think that it's, it's totally applicable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tell me, girl, that's a big one. Oh my god, that's like a tattoo worthy, you know? Right. <laughs> we want to like, avoid the suffering. We want to avoid those challenges because it's hard. It's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like the human yeah. condition. Avoid meant, pain. I thought you meant you want to avoid the tattoo pain. <laughs> okay. She's like that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, one final one. Do you have one more? One. Could be a random draw. Ooh, let's do a yeah. A random could be fun. Not so random. Let's see. This one says my lungs help me breathe. That's just like a body appreciation one. You know what, though? I think that people need that a lot more. The lungs help me breathe. Like, I mean, how many times have you been frustrated? And if you really sit and just connect with your breath and with your body for like a few minutes, you can drop yes. back into self and just really regulate your whole nervous system. That's another one, actually. I can use my breath to calm my emotions. Mm. Okay, I think that's a good one. Let's 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 wrap it. End on that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. It was so wonderful to connect with you, and we we so appreciate and have so much gratitude for the work that you're doing. Thank and you. And let let our listeners know where they can find you. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate this conversation very much. People can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Feel Good Dietitian, and my website is laurencadillac.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, and thank we'll see everyone next week. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye.